Okay, I think uh, more people might be coming later. So today we continue our discussion on finite volume methods. Particularly, we want to answer the question of uh, how does finite volume method solve discontinuities, which our previously introduced method, finite difference, was not able to handle. Right? So first of all, how can a differential equation describe continuity? I mean discontinuity. Right? Discontinuity in a solution of a differential equation means at a certain point, the solution can no longer be differentiated, which means the differential equation cannot hold anymore. Right? So what does it mean even by saying that a solution to a differential equation has a discontinuity. Anybody? But definition of differential equation has to take derivatives, right? How can you take derivatives across a discontinuity? You average them, that's right. So the differential equation if it develops discontinuity, cannot be viewed as a differential equation anymore. It can only be viewed as a conservation law, right? A conservation of mass, conservation of momentum, conservation of energy, conservation of molecules that can just uh, be described in a differential form. And the general differential equation that describes conservation is partial u partial t plus a divergence of a flux equal to a source. Why would this type of equations be able to describe conservation? How can we see that this kind of equations actually describes the conservation of some quantity? How can we go from the differential form to the statement of conservation of something? Uh, you need to set it equal to zero. So you could say like, or not zero, but like some constant. I said, I, it's already an equation, right? So the right hand side is S, which is the source, really. You integrate over space or time? Uh, Time, space, either or, either or. You've got, a time, you've got a time term and a space term. I get a time term which is ddt. I also have a space term that is divergence. The divergence contains spatial derivatives, right? Well, the divergence term, the, the spatial term, should be like that's like if you have a balloon and you're blowing up a balloon, like so you don't have a flux or you know, clear mark, right? You go to the so how do we go from the differential form to a statement of conservation of something? The correct answer is integral, but integration over what? Uh, the boundary. Uh, the boundary of what? So you are, you are saying integration in space, right? So there are there are some answering integration in time, some say integration in space. Integrating space or time? Space. Space per share, but should include time as well. Pardon? Space per share, but should include time as well. Should I do time as well? That's actually a good question. So, yeah, um, usually what we do is we'll integrate in space first because that'll give us an ordinary differential equation that gets rid of all the spatial derivatives. That gives me an ordinary differential equation that describes how does the total conserved quantity within a fixed volume increase or decrease. So integrating that in space that's usually what we do first so integrating both of these over dx okay and what you get is that integrating over a fixed space actually commutes with the time derivative that's usually not true if the volume also changes shifts moves right but if it's a fixed volume it commutes with the time derivative. So the first term becomes a ddt 
of the total u within that space. So this is the time derivative term of the ODE that describes if this term is positive, that means the total stuff in the volume is increasing. If it's negative, that means the total stuff in the term is decreasing. Then this is equal to, let's move this term to the right hand side. It's use Gauss's theorem or the divergence theorem. The integration of a divergence over a volume is equal to integration over partial omega. What is partial omega? It's the boundary. It's the boundary of omega. It's a one less dimensional object than the volume omega, right? So if omega is three dimensional, partial omega is the surface of this three dimensional domain. If omega is a two dimensional area, partial omega is the curve that encloses this area. If omega is an interval in one dimension, what is partial omega? Two points, right? The two points that encloses this interval. And I have a minus n. And minus n is the inward surface normal. Usually we the, the general uh the general convention is to denote the surface normal as the outward surface normal, right? The minus n would be the inverse surface normal because I moved the this term from the left hand side to the to the right hand side. Dot with the f. Okay and the ds plus s dx. So again, conservation formula says that the time derivative of the total mass or energy or momentum inside the volume is equal to the rate of inward flux right through the boundary plus how much is contributed from the sources within that volume. Any question on that? So a specialization is in one spatial dimension, right? So if I have a, a single spatial dimension, the time derivative would be integration over an interval, any interval, would be equal to, okay, here's a challenge in 1D. I said the partial omega is just the two points. What is minus n? What is minus n at A? What is minus n at B? One is plus one, the other is minus one. Which one is plus one? Which one is minus one? A is plus one, B is minus one. Yes. So so it's a uh, n is the outward normal, which means at B, the right hand side pointing outward is the plus direction. At A, right, the outward direction is the minus direction. So minus n would be uh, plus 1 at A and minus 1 at B, right? Then plus the source term inside the interval. 